Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our friends on the West Coast. Welcome today to today's web seminar, Threat Assessments 101, Understanding the Red Flags of Workplace Violence. My name is Brian McElravey. I'm the Executive Vice President and GM of our Corporate Security Division here at Resolver. And on behalf of Resolver Marketing, I'll be your host and moderator for today's session. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Resolver, let me give you the brief. Over a thousand organizations around the world depend on Resolver security, risk, and compliance software to plan, prepare, respond, and recover to protect what matters. That's people, property, and information. We serve customers across all kinds of industries, all kinds of business needs with tools ranging from risk assessment, enterprise risk management, internal audit, incident investigation management software, incident response, recently business resilience, and of course, threat management. So with that, first, let me say thank you for taking the time to attend today's presentation. I know everyone has busy schedules, so we certainly appreciate your time today. We literally have hundreds of people in this session, so it shows the significant interest in this topic. Threats of violence come in many different forms. We all know that. And the greatest challenge is knowing which threats pose a real risk of violence. What are the red flags to look for? What steps should you take? That's the discussion we have on tap for you today. But before we get started, just a few things I want to cover with you for some uh, brief tour of the navigations here. Uh, in front of you, if you are signed in and hearing this audio correctly, you should see the presentation panel in front of you. It says Threat Assessments 101, Understanding the Red Flags. Um, at the bottom of that screen, if you take your mouse and move your cursor over it, you won't see it on, on here, but on yours, you'll see uh, some tools at the bottom. One of those tools is called the Q&A button. As we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, we are on a one-way voice so you can hear us. We will not be able to hear you. So what I'll ask you to do is click that Q&A button, type in your question into the window and submit it to us. That's gonna come over and we will answer your questions at the end of the session during our QA. So before we get started with threat assessments and understanding the red flags, let me introduce our two fabulous speakers to you. Today we have two very well accomplished and respected gentlemen. First, Dr. Stephen White. Dr. White is a psychologist who has dedicated his entire career to threat assessment and workplace violence prevention. He's the president of Workplace Trauma Services. He has consulted on thousands, literally thousands of threat cases in his career for Fortune 500 companies, government, law enforcement, universities, you name it. He's contributed his expertise and experience to both the FBI and the ASIS International to develop their public guidelines for workplace violence prevention. He is also the co-author of the Workplace Assessment of Violence Risk known as Waiver 21, which you're going to hear uh, quite a bit about today. Uh, the first and most widely recognized scientifically based structured professional judgment guide for assessing workplace violence risk. Excellent program that you'll hear about today. Also joining Dr. White is his colleague, Dr. Reed Malloy. Dr. Malloy is a forensic psychologist, clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. He too has consulted on countless criminal and civil cases. He's authored or co-authored over 250 peer reviewed journals, 11 books, He's been published in the Washington Post, Huffington Post, New York Times, all kinds of magazines, including GQ magazine. Take a look at that smile up there. Is he not a GQ man? For sure, for sure. Finally, he consults with the FBI behavioral analysis units and was also the technical consultant for the TV show CSI. So people, if there were two guys that you wanted to have at hand to talk workplace violence and threat assessment, it does not get much better than Dr. Malloy and Dr. Dr. White. And let me tell you, they're both great guys. So with that, Dr. White, Dr. Merloy, this show is all yours. Over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Stephen White. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to take about the first 10 minutes of this session, and I'm going to go over just, uh, just highlight some of the fundamentals about threat assessment and organizational context, uh, best practices, do's and don'ts, uh, and then we'll get into uh, the role of structured guides, and of course, especially the waiver 21, which Reed and I have, have developed, and we'll, uh, we'll have a, a Q&A session at the end. We're going to illustrate these things through a, a case, which is a good way in this short session to just show how these principles apply. So what, what we know now is that this may seem very complicated, but violence risk, it is complex, but it is comprehensible, and it can be managed. And we've learned a great deal about the both the individual risk factors as well as organizational factors that contribute to violence and protocols do exist and have been developed 
uh, for dealing with these multiple scenarios that may come to your attention. Now, here's a case, and I'm just going to uh, read it here. And if you can uh, uh, minimize my photos there on the right a little bit or move them over. But anyway, this is a, this is a hairy case, and I'll just read it to you. Agnes is a young associate in a client group, and she requests an urgent meeting with her HR manager. She comes into the office. She's very anxious and troubled. And near tears, Agnes says, this is very hard for me, but I have to tell you this. I can't keep it to myself any longer. I've been having an affair with Jerry, my manager. He's married, you know, and I want to get out of the relationship, but he's threatened me and says things like, if I can't have you, nobody will. Now, Agnes confides that Jerry alludes to having firearms, and he's physically abused his wife in the past. The police have been to their house, and Agnes adds that some of the coworkers in their department are aware of the personal relationship between the two of them. Some fear for her safety as well as their own. Some resent her for the favors that Jerry has extended her. And the manager knows that Jerry's rumored to be manipulative, intimidating, a selfish, dishonest bully. He may have driven his previous boss to quit, hasn't been consistently disciplined. Uh, Agnes has said that he told me if he loses his job over this, he'll have nothing left. I'm scared. She asked that he'll never know all this stuff. And as she rushes out the door, she says, oh, I'm afraid his whole life is falling apart. Uh, and off she goes. So you see this situation. Uh, it, there's a technical term for it. It's called a mess. And there's lots going on. But we are about safety first. So these are the questions that would confront you uh, as you think about this case. How would you estimate Jerry's risk for violence? How did you get to that conclusion? How does your organization assess risk? What do you see as viable alternatives? Can your practice withstand scrutiny? These are important in this day and age. We'll come back to this. There's a few contextual factors to point out. One is a cultural script, which is sort of a fancy sociological term for the copycat phenomenon that we're all familiar with. And this is, these fellows at the bottom here are some you would recognize, the Columbine shooters, uh, Mr. Cho from, uh, from Virginia Tech, and the fellow on the left is uh, one of the first uh, postal shooters. But these individuals understand that they can have a certain impact and be notorious if they carry out this the, uh, these uh, horrible acts and they've studied previous assassins. So we're all aware of this. The other factor is there's a great deal of fear and disruption that can follow from a threat case, regardless of how objectively uh, it may pose a risk. So we're always dealing with that. The other dilemma is these are low probability events, difficult to find the hot ones. So we're, they're catastrophic, of course, when they happen. So you have sort of a haystack phenomenon statistically and operationally. So these are things that we have to keep in mind. This is a graphic of a well-known, the well-known pathway to violence, which has been validated over and over. I won't go into the stages here. You can see what they are, how someone goes from a grievance all the way up. They plan these things, they escalate to the final attack. Note the big point here, people do not snap, they decide. This is cold, predatory, planned violence. Okay. People leave signs, and that's what assessment is all about. Now, in a successful program, these are just the highlights of what exists. You have a policy, of course, that you take these things seriously. You have a team in place. It's multidisciplinary. They've been trained. They have links to experts. There's also a well-defined and uh, uh, presented reporting protocol and process so people know who to call and what's going to happen, basically. And there's organizational-wide awareness uh, of, of this policy and the program and how it works. It's proactive, not reactive. Here's some of the com uh, common challenges. The silo effect. Information is there. This is information-driven, this process. But information is, is hidden. It's in silos. People know things. They don't recognize what it may mean. They don't report it. So therefore, nobody can connect all the dots. Uh, missing a hot one, of course, is the biggest mistake that nobody wants to make. So we have to be prepared to catch those. But another common uh, fallacy is that people will over-respond if they don't have training and readiness and people who are prepared to deal with this. They can over-respond to what we refer to as the nothing burgers and waste time and resources 
uh, on things that aren't that serious, and you can't do this over and over. You've got to be more efficient. The hasty termination is uh, another related phenomenon where, for instance, somebody says, well, Jerry made a threat, and he's a, certainly a despicable person. We have to protect the workplace. We'll fire him and get him out of here, and, and that's our, our response. Well, the problem is that if Jerry could pose a risk, you may have triggered him, and that's where the last box comes in, unintended consequences. No matter what we do to prevent violence, it could suppress aggression and violence. It could work. Uh, but it also could have no effect because the fellow just isn't going to be violent, or he's going to be violent uh, unless you physically stop him. And finally, you can make things worse. You can agitate a situation unnecessarily by taking some measure that is not necessary. And that brings us back to assessment. Now, finally here, just some of the strategic guidelines. There are emergencies, of course, but what we've learned over and over is in almost all cases, you can slow down, assess first, take an hour, an hour and a half to gather the relevant data, get a, an initial hypothesis about the case, anticipate triggering events like a termination or a rejection of some kind. Now, it's always true with terminations, you want to protect people's dignity. It's even more important with these individuals who are vulnerable uh, to risk. You want to avoid shaming, protect their dignity as much as you can. Do not overreact and go to war if you don't need to. Of course, there are times when, when you have to be very tough and firm. But uh, this is where judgment and deliberation come in. We're always going to need judgment uh, in these situations, even though we're using tools to help us in evidence-based tools. That's where the structured guides and the, the waiver come in. We are not profiling uh, individuals. We're not predicting violence. We are managing behaviors of concern in the present. This is just a list of the common uh, intervention options. Uh, note again, it says no cookbook, judgment, deliberation are always necessary. But these are, these are the tools that are common in threat assessment. Uh, background checks when appropriate. Collateral interviews are very important with witnesses, managers, et cetera. Uh, obviously, the interview with a subject or uh, employee of concern. Uh, professional assessments, like Reed and I do. Uh, we may have an opportunity to help with diffusing those scenarios. Protective orders, security, law enforcement, uh, assistance, treatment, uh, voluntary, involuntary, and all of these things can have, they can work or not work very well. Again, that's why we always talk about the pros and cons of doing uh, <clears throat> these various actions. Um, and no one size fits all. There's different ways to resolve these things, including severance packages, etc. In many cases, we're wanting people to just move on. And again, this takes lots of discussion. So this is just the list of the options and some of the principles here. Now, uh, one other point I want to make is, <clears throat> of course, this makes you ask, well, what, uh, who should assess what? We are not uh, so-called experts who believe you have to call us every time or somebody like us when you have an issue or you're concerned. This is impractical, especially the larger organizations or universities get. You have to have a team that has skills and can at least screen cases, uh, do triage. You take it as far as you are comfortable and as far as you are competent. Then you have links uh, to so-called experts when you need them, but this is an interdisciplinary process. Intuitively, security is involved, uh, human resources, judicial affairs, employment attorneys, uh, as well as the assessment experts, and there's a blend of, of specialties that uh, makes for a better process and a uh, that takes into all these different perspectives and the expertise that different people have. So, and uh, finally, just an indirect assessment is when people like us are just looking at what the data is that's available. A direct assessment includes the face-to-face -face interview with an individual <clears throat> of concern. Okay, so that's just an overview of some of those principles. The case of Jerry, keep that in mind. You can see that he has lots of obvious warning signs that we're going to come back to uh, as we talk about the waiver 21 and how we assess Jerry and how that is also uh, how we also use the new 
Resolver app that we're very excited about uh, in, uh, in, in, in using uh, the app to uh, further the assessment of Jerry in this case. So we'll come back to that case. Okay, Reed. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, what I wanted to do was to talk you a little bit about um, the waiver 21 and put it in the context of uh, the science in this field. Uh, these are basically called structured professional judgment guides. And what they do is they help us organize our thinking. Uh, you don't score these. You don't, they're not quantified. Uh, what you're doing instead is you're gathering data based upon the research that tells us those data points are related to workplace violence. And then you're thinking about that data in a rational way, and we're trying to get emotion on the sideline. And the Structured Professional Judgment Guide, like the Waiver 21, uh, helps us do that. Uh, this is rapidly becoming the standard of practice. It allows us to identify uh, factors that are related to violence with risk and have been shown to be so, but also not pay attention to factors which are unrelated uh, to violence risk. And we also know that these guides uh, in the context of a threat assessment team will help us improve the consistency of the work that we do. It keeps it very transparent. Uh, it allows for continuity of assessment and also continuity of management as the case dynamically unfolds over time. Now, there are a number of structured professional judgment guides. Uh, Steve and I are very pleased that the, the Waiver 21 has uh, made its mark as the guide to use in the workplace. Uh, here is listing a couple of others that we wanted to uh, bring out to you. There's probably about 60 structured professional guides throughout forensic psychology and psychiatry. The HCR version three is uh, one of the granddaddy uh, risk assessment instruments, the new stalking risk profile. Uh, the spousal assault risk assessment is specific to uh, domestic violence. The risk for sexual violence, uh, a new instrument that I've uh, developed, the terrorist radicalization assessment protocol, the TRAP-18. And then of course, our instrument here at the bottom, the Waiver 21, which has been the basis for the development of the threat assessment app with Resolver. Now, uh, here is a look at, just very, very briefly, the third edition. This came out in 2016. The first one was in 2007. But as uh, we see in all of science, um, as, you, uh, as you develop instruments, they're, uh, they're, they're always a work in progress. And so this is our third edition, but we're very excited because we think it's the most substantial and also allows for the integration of new research, which has been done in this particular field. And then we've expanded it to explicitly include a campus, university, college context. Uh, what our focus is in this instrument is specifically on targeted violence. And you saw Steve talk about the pathway to violence. And uh, this is not violence that's uh, emotionally driven. When these individuals begin to plan and prepare for their act of violence, they're ac actually feeling very calm uh, and very collected. In fact, I've, uh, in the individuals I've interviewed that have committed mass murder in the workplace and in other places, typically they describe a very calm and methodical emotional state as they progress. We've also had that confirmed by people that have witnessed uh, these events. So this whole notion that people are highly emotional when they do these acts is just not true and the research clearly uh, supports that. The waiver also address a broader network of other kinds of behaviors such as bullying, stalking, and maliciousness. We've tried to make, uh, uh, in a sense, the target population, these would be people in your community, whether you're in a corporate setting or a university setting, these would be people that could potentially be threatened, and that becomes, in a sense, your community of concern. And then also the waiver can be a gateway instrument leading to the use of more specific instruments uh, that are key in a case. For instance, you'll see on the waiver that one of the items is specific to psychopathic personality. And there, if you did a case where you realized that you had a psychopathic individual that you were concerned about in your setting, that you might want a much more fuller evaluation just using that particular instrument. So the waiver gives you a lens through which you can look at the person initially and then perhaps even use other instruments as a way to refine and deepen your evaluation of that person of concern. 
Now, here are the risk factors, and uh, uh, given uh, the brevity of the time that we're able to spend with you today, I just wanted to have you take a look at these. And uh, these risk, uh, risk factors essentially remain unchanged uh, from the first waiver. We've made some adjustments in the version three, uh, but fun the fundamentals of these 21 items are very, very stable. Uh, we call this red flag indicators as the name of this particular, um, this particular one hour training. And I want to highlight for you that the red flag indicators on the waiver are the first five items you'll see on the left. Motives for violence, homicidal fantasies, preoccupations and identifications, threatening communications or expressed intent. Uh, typically threats come in two forms. They're either direct threats or they're what we call leakage where a person communicates their intent to a third party that they're gonna attack a target. A fourth is weapon skill and access. We're very interested in the degree to which the person uh, has developed skill in the use of firearms, uh, explosive devices, or cutting instruments. And then number five is pre-attack planning and preparation. And that's one of the late stage markers in the pathway uh, that Steve showed you. Now those are the, uh, in a sense, uh, the hot button uh, evaluation points that we're looking at in every case. And if you don't have any of those and you've thoroughly investigated, you can breathe a sigh of relief and then you can take your time to continue to evaluate the case. It's not imminent. And then you'll notice all these other factors um, are in a sense more distal or more distant from an act of targeted violence. Yet the research tells us uh, do correlate with targeted violence. And I'll let you just take a, a look at those. And we'll be revisiting these in just a little bit toward the end of the talk. Uh, now, the scientific basis for the waiver tw 21 is something that I'm very interested in. Uh, this is slow work. Uh, it has to be methodical. The papers have to be reviewed by science journals. We began by uh, looking at our experience as well as the experience of others, as well as all the research on what are the violence risk factors in the workplace. Uh, we looked at our uh, accumulated professional practice as well as our colleagues. Uh, we then, once we had assembled the instrument, uh, we did our initial reliability studies. We had a good to excellent inter-rater reliability on the instrument. Uh, simply put, what that means is that people generally agree on how to code each of the items on a particular case. And then uh, the other thing that's very exciting is that we have a, um, a validity study that's been submitted uh, that was done independently of us by the University of Nebraska. And this is a study where we look at cases where there are known outcomes for the case, but then the coders don't know what those outcomes are, yet they have all the other data on the case. And for the uh, statistical folks that are watching this, we had an area under the curve of 0 0.70 uh, as a predictive validity uh, uh, indicator uh, telling us that this instrument is right in the ballpark with where we want it to be in terms of its predictive ability in looking at whether a case would turn out to be violent or not. And so that's very exciting for us. We expect that, uh, that study to be in press when we hear from the authors of it oh, within the next uh, uh, six to nine months. Now, practically speaking, in terms of threat assessment and uh, teamwork, we're very much focused on interdisciplinary teams. Uh, the days of the, in a sense, the Lone Ranger uh, going out and taking care of all threats in the company are gone. That is substandard practice now. Uh, we need to focus on the development of interdisciplinary teams. And then what the waiver does, uh, whether you're using the threat app or using the printed edition, is it helps you to focus just on risk relevant information and in a sense, take the emotion out of the case and allow people to think about objective evidence in the case and to investigate it further to see whether or not it is present for each of the 21 uh, items. And we're also, we're, we're always testing, uh, we're always trying to disconfirm our hypothesis uh, from a science perspective. In other words, we're testing uh, to see if there is also no information on a particular item, and we want to pay close attention to that. This also helps us with transparency of the work that we're doing. For too long, uh, threat assessment in corporate settings has been 
fairly subjective and a lot of people have brought in their personal experiences in making judgments. Science has told us that does not work, uh, that has poor reliability and validity. But what does work is when you structure your professional judgment. And this also, uh, for instance, with the, with the app in particular, it allows you uh, to be recording in real time as a case move forward, as a case moves forward in one particular place that is uh, secured, uh, all the information and evidence that's being gathered, when it's being gathered, and how that translates into a coding level for a particular item. Uh, that transparency is very important, particularly if there are uh, civil suits that arise out of a particular case. This is an area where I do work uh, as, an, as an expert. And now the questions are always, uh, what did you know? When did you know it? How was that information communicated? Where is that information recorded? And this is very important in the ongoing work of threat assessment teams and will continue to be more important as it it becomes embedded as a standard of practice in threat assessment in the workplace. Uh, and finally, you see the third point here. This really demonstrates the reasonableness of the organization and the actions that the organization has taken. I'm gonna kick things over now back to, uh, back to Steve, and we're gonna talk specifically about the, uh, the threat application. Steve? Okay, thank you, Reed. So, um... Now we're gonna uh, talk about the waiver and the waiver threat assessment app and in the context of the case about Jerry. You can see intuitively again, Jerry made threats. He's being rejected by Agnes. He's gonna be exposed. Uh, his personality is not very attractive as a, a responsible individual. And uh, you, you would sense this. And yet with, with the waiver and other SPJs, again, this gives you evidence-based structure. Uh, and with the app, uh, I, I, I can tell you already, as I use it, it's saving me time, things are more organized. It's much easier to keep track of chronologies of events as well as actions. So let's look at uh, the app here uh, in the context of the Jerry case and how it works. We go to the, the new case queue here, and this is where you enter initial information and incident report. Now, people in your community can, there's a portal to report, of course, in our see something, say something world, they report these incidents. And uh, an individual sends this message to, to the team or the screener. Jerry allegedly threatened Agnes if she broke off their relationship. Of course, this is a summary, a uh, person could say more. You name the individual, it's reported by Michelle. Also, it can be reported anonymously, what, uh, the dates. Uh, so we, are, we have the structure here, it's all in one place. And then also a quick screening uh, uh, page, which uh, the waiver includes. So the person who's, who's screening these cases can look at these five uh, clear indicators, most of them related to the red flags that Reed talked about. For instance, are there threats or expressed ideas to harm? In this case, yes, and you can say yes, no, or unsure. If it's yes, it's red. Behaviors that cause concern, obviously that's a yes uh, in this situation. The subject has access to weapons or attempted to gain. We put down yes in this case. Now, granted in case investigation, initial reports, the behaviors are alleged. We have to keep in mind the A word, it's alleged. Let's assume we confirm this, but we put it yes, or we might have put it unsure, and then it changed to yes. Bizarre thinking or distinctly irrational suspiciousness. Now, this is, this is language that describes psychosis. And in the waiver third edition, one thing we did, we talk about psychosis very specifically and how it relates to violence, but we don't have the item labeled paranoia or psychotic phenomena like we did in previous editions. We, we put in irrational thinking, bizarre thinking, uh, extreme suspiciousness. This helps non-clinical people avoid looking like they're assessing people inappropriately and therefore possibly discriminating. In any case, back to Jerry. He's not crazy in simple language. I don't think he is. So he might be, we determine later, but let's say in this case, no. So we say no. 
Are there circumstances or anticipated events that might affect the likelihood? Absolutely. It's possible Jerry could lose his job. Uh, that's another loss piled onto him. So that's a yes. Now, response priority level. This is not the same as risk level or level of concern about risk, but how significant is this case in dealing with it in a timely fashion? Our judgment was it's high priority case because you can't let this sit until Tuesday. We don't know how fast things might be moving in this situation. So then we go to the assessment worksheet and this is the uh, there's a, a very comprehensive intake document with the waiver V3 and with the uh, app, which has been expanded from V2. But let's take a look at the, how we would start an assessment with the worksheet. So put in the name, the date of the assessment, uh, who was this assigned to, this was assigned to me, I was contacted by the company. Remember that assessments have a short shelf life, they're dynamic, they, they uh, uh, go back and forth between the intervention and then an updated assessment. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we did an initial assessment and then let's look at the worksheet here as let's assume we've moved down the line here and this is an assessment uh, later on, say after we collected a lot of collateral data and also did an assessment meeting with Jerry per se. Uh, we have uh, uh, the uh, Coding information, again, identifying uh, the situation. This is item number one, motives for violence. Is Jerry motivated or some individual actually motivated for some reason uh, to, to act violently? Is it revenge? Is it to bring attention to a problem, notoriety? Um, is it uh, some, some reason particular to the individual that motivates them to actually be violent. If it's not a motive for violence, then what is the motive? What is the explanation for the behavior? We explain all this in the manual. For instance, he might be saying these things to Agnes, threatening her just to control her. If you leave me, I'll find you. If I can't have you, nobody will. Is he just trying to keep her from leaving as opposed to he really means it? And that's the work of a fuller assessment. So here's item number one, motives for violence. And, uh, it's, uh, we would mark that as uh, present down the road. Let's, let's assume that Jerry does have that motive. And so we would mark that as such. Uh, and then we go down all through the list. Uh, we make notes, he's threatened her. We would fill this in as we developed it. We say, uh, based on the interview, Jerry uh, clearly had these ideas of, of, of killing Agnes, then himself, he wants to end the whole thing in a homicide, suicide that, that is not uncommon in, in the intimate partner violence scenarios, and they can happen, although they can happen in the workplace, but they're infrequent. But anyway, this all gets uh, entered into the notes section and on the worksheet, and then uh, it's coded present here. Uh, why isn't it prominent? Well, it could be prominent, and it, it depends on, on uh, uh, the individual, and again, these things can change. And here's the simple definitions that are in the manual that describe absent, present, and prominent for any case that you're working on. And we recognize that some of you may be thinking, well, my goodness, I don't have time to do this for everything that comes across my desk. Well, that's where your judgment comes in. And as Rita said, you're accountable and you need to show a, a rational process. Is it documented? Uh, are you sure you should uh, not spend more time with this case and make sure uh, that things are documented and that you showed a rational process for screening and assessment, conferring when appropriate. Okay, so there's just the first item. It, uh, it, uh, the app goes down into all the other items, of course. The items, the, the, the waiver is not, you don't add them up cumulatively, mathematically. You integrate and weigh them. This is not a, a psychological test, but it's a structured guide, of course, as we've explained. Uh, and you have to look in each case, how does a particular item relate to the other items? Uh, a person could have owned guns, but they could own guns and be proficient, but they don't have any trouble right now. They just happen to own guns. Well, then it's not really uh, an indicator of risk. But if Jerry gets a gun or a, 
or another gun uh, or starts practicing at the range, then that, that's different. He's on item five, pre-attack planning. Now, this is Jerry's, this is Jerry's um, waiver uh, later on, okay? And the red ones we decided in this case, after all the evidence that these were the indicators that were uh, prominent or present, uh, he's made threats, he has a motive, he does have the skill, uh, stalking or menacing behavior, uh, number five, pre-attack planning. That one, uh, it's present, but also uh, to a certain extent, all of these have insufficient information and we always want to know more. So we may indicate that along with the item. Uh, if it's gray, it, it's like it's, it's not there. Uh, he's not somebody who's immersed in, in violent media like a potential mass murder. He's not that kind of guy, uh, but he's clearly thinking about it. Uh, violence and planning it, menacing behavior. He does have a current job or academic problem. Uh, let's say in this case, he wasn't all that attached to his job, but he could be. He could, and that's a very important indicator with, with the waiver is um, how attached, if somebody loses their job, is it the end of their world? Or would Jerry just want to move along. He says, I'll get another job. Just let me out of here. He may want to resign. These are all the questions. But extreme job or academic attachment is very uh, important in uh, organizational risk assessment. Adding academic to seven and eight are one of, is one of the changes, by the way, uh, with uh, waiver, waiver three. Clearly, Jerry has losses. Seven, eight, nine are what we call the loss triad. He's got significant losses. Let's say he was drinking and just blaming everybody else. Uh, that would be negative coping. He's not being smart about it. He's got entitlement issues. He's self-centered, lack of conscience and irresponsibility. That's the psychopathy indicator on the waiver. Uh, we might evaluate him on the continuum there. He's at least irresponsible. Anger problems, yes. Uh, suicidality, depressive mood. And on down the list, things that are absent, present, uh, or prominent, uh, depending on all the, the data that we gathered. And again, this can all be put into the app uh, where the screener or the assessor, depending on what stage we're in in the case, uh, can integrate these things coming up with an initial opinion, an intermediate opinion, uh, a later on opinion. Notice number 20 is stabilizers and buffers. This is the good news in a case. These are the indicators that suggest somebody is less likely to be violent. They have positive attachments. They have a family. They have a conscience. They apologize. They get a lawyer. They do smart things, or they have a moral uh, compass that says, I would never do that. That's not me, even if I make threats. So 20 uh, is also very important, the protective factors. If you don't look at those, you may tend to overestimate risk. That's been shown in the, uh, in the research. And finally, 21, organizational impact of real or perceived threats. That's not a factor, risk or protective factor per se, but we're always dealing with the fear and disruption, as I mentioned earlier. So we code that on the waiver. Are people missing work? Uh, are their spouses calling and saying, why don't you do something about that horrible person, Jerry, before he harms my spouse? These are all disruptive uh, things that you have to keep track of. You you're managing them in a parallel uh, manner with the case. And so we just coded that on the waiver as an important source of information. I do want to mention 19 situational organizational contributors. This is the, these are the external factors. In Jerry's case, nobody's, taking, nobody's paying attention to Jerry. He hasn't been managed. If there's no program, no protocol, by definition, that's a risk factor. You're, you're in a reactive versus a proactive stance. So that's a crucial item uh, on the waiver. Okay, so there's an overview in this case of waiver factors related to Jerry or others as well. And now I think, uh, what do we have next? This is our concluding statement before we get to Q&A. Identify the issues before they become incidents. Uh, be proactive, we're gonna see something, say something, and do something world. Unfortunately, that's the way things are. But these tools and these processes, uh, they do work. We've been doing this many years. We're not saying you're going to stop everything that could happen. But uh, 
this, these, these protocols and processes, I think many of you would, would recognize, uh, are effective and keep, uh, keep the company, the organization organized as they, as they deal with them. So I think we're ready for some Q&A at this point, Dr. Malloy. Yeah, that sounds it? good, Steve. Yeah, let's okay. go to the Q&A. Okay, oh, doctors, okay. thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Fantastic <laughs> presentation. I can tell you that because we have a lot of comments on here asking for a copy of the presentation, a copy of the recording people are liking what they're hearing. So for everyone on the line, uh, after this, you will get a link to the, uh, the webinar being recorded and be able to hear all of this again. And just to, to preface, the doctors have put years and years of scientific research into waiver and it's a lot to to comprehend in, in 45 minutes but they have a lot more to to tell you about it um so just to start on that question doctors one of the big questions here is just how does someone get how does an organization or someone get involved in the the waiver process or start to understand it where do they go how do they start so either one of you can take that one well we have a website i'll, I'll start here and let uh Reed come in we have a website and uh, not surprisingly, the website is waiver21.com, W-A-V-R-2-1.com. Uh, it has lots of information about uh, the waiver, obviously, how to purchase the hard copy manual, which may be a good place for many people to start. Um, each of the items has uh, two to four pages of descriptive information about the item, about how to use the waiver, about its scientific basis. So the manual, and we wrote it to be very practically oriented. I've worked with organizations for years. I know how people think and that they want to get to the point, but they want substance. Uh, the waiver's very, the manual's very handy that way. We each also have websites. We offer different kinds of training. Uh, we refer to the waiver gold training, which is a two-day training that Reed and I do, we can come uh, to your organization and do it. We also are doing a public uh, two-day waiver uh, training in Mountain View, November 30th and December 1st this year. There's still room, people are signing up, but there is room, that's November 30th, December 1st in Mountain View, California. And that information is on waiver21.com. We're happy to answer questions about the waiver. Uh, I'll tell you, but my website is uh, wtsglobal.com. That has uh, more information as well. Uh, Reed, you want to uh, make any other comments there? Uh, I, I just add, Steve, that um, again, the the threat assessment app of the waiver, I think, is is really just an important step into the 21st century uh, for the instrument, uh, primarily because it helps us move from uh, paper to a yeah. secure uh, digitized format and it helps protect corporations uh, uh, in uh, the kind of litigious atmosphere that we all live in and it really enhances the transparency and rationality of the work that we're doing and Steve and I are happy to uh, talk to folks about uh, uh, the live trainings uh, that we're doing. Uh, we also have an extended training, uh, a, actually a three-hour training through the uh, Global Institute of Forensic Research, which is um, uh, the gifrinc.com. And that has uh, continuing education credits uh, offered for uh, a number of different professions. So again, that's gifrinc. Uh, dot com for an extended uh, three-hour training uh, on the waiver. But as Steve mentioned, uh, uh, the the gold standard for us is the is the two-hour training where we actually uh, come okay. in and then work with your teams uh, over the course of two days uh, with uh, case studies, uh, videotapes, uh, lots of group interaction, lots of didactics, we talk about research, and, uh, and fundamentally, Steve and I find it just great fun uh, to do that because it's a much more personal connection with the folks that are doing this work in the field. Yeah. And you meet a lot of cool people there. Let me, let me just say that uh, the app, people have, this is a resolver question that they can answer, but the, it's very secure, and resolver can answer your questions about. Yeah, actually, that'll take me into the, um, 
the, the next question along the side with that was, what is the actual name of the app and where do I get it? And is it a separate app and what's the cost and how do we do that? So I'll take that one. So the, the app is called the Threat Assessment Tool for Waiver 21. It is uh, from Resolver. You go to resolver.com or reach out to uh, one of our reps there or you'll get an email after this. You can reach out to us at any, at any point. Uh, it's a tool that works directly with the Waiver 21 program so they go hand in hand mm -hmm. um and like dr molloy mentioned earlier it takes everything that in waiver 21 that's gone from paper and pen and now it's available in a software uh format that they showed you on there uh one thing to note from uh from us is that everyone on the webinar today does get a discount to that app um i believe it's regular 14.95 or so per uh, individual. Uh, if you're an attendee on this this uh, webinar today, I believe it is 995 for the first user. You can discuss those details with um, with some people at Resolver here at your convenience. Okay, doctors, we're going to get into some more meaty questions for you beyond uh, this. Uh, we'll start at the end there, Dr. White. You mentioned the the last thing was when you have an incident, looking for the early warning things, and one. Uh, attendee here asked specifically, can you cover some of the predictive indicators, those traits, conduct, statements, or other actions that serve as early warning to prevent an incident? Can you, can you comment on that? Because it, it, it tailed right in there when you were presenting that. Sure. Um, uh, I will comment and let read it as well. You know, we did mention the, the, the red flags. The, the sort of the, the an issue here is like, with the with the uh, the five indicators in in the beginning, you know, you, if somebody makes a threat, something's wrong, and you have to take it seriously. And you, and threats per se are not very good predictors of who's going to be violent. They are pretty good predictors in intimate partner situations, but you always have to take it seriously. And if people are afraid something's wrong, um, and it it may be. It may be blatant. Somebody could say to a coworker, um, you know, you've been a good guy and I've always liked you, and even though I hate this company, uh, and I want you to stay home tomorrow, but keep your eye on CNN. Whoa. <laughs> now that sounds pretty scary. Or uh, somebody uh, could say, a disgruntled husband could say, uh, today's the day I'm coming down there to get you and your new boyfriend. I don't care about the cops. So that's, you know, on the surface, like very serious. You have to get into the details, though, in that first hour and gather as much information as you can, recognizing there's a need for speed versus the need for more information. And put it together as quickly as you can. Some things may be more subtle. Somebody could be very psychotic and very paranoid. You have to respond to that, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be fine. And you have to look at the other factors as quickly as you can uh, and, and get an initial take on the case. Now, it may sound like, I mean, I can't just say, yeah, these, these things for sure, it's serious. Uh, some are very obvious, some aren't. Uh, you have to get into it very, very quickly. If somebody's been a good employee and they just get angry about their poor review, but there's no history and nobody's afraid and he's got anchors and buffers. It's like, well, that doesn't sound very serious, but you got to look. That's, that's one way to look at it. I'll let Reed uh, give his uh, version of this. Yeah. The, the point, a couple points that come to mind for me, Steve, on that is that, that the threatening communication issue is a very important one because in targeted violence, as Steve said, direct threats, uh, are, are typically not predictive because most people that are planning and preparing for an act of targeted violence do not directly threaten their target beforehand because obviously it tactically doesn't serve their purpose. But what we know from the research is that most individuals, and when I say most, I mean the vast majority of individuals that engage in targeted violence do uh, leak their intent to third parties. And basically what that means is they tell a third party uh, that they're intending to attack a particular target. They don't tell the target. And now in the age, the digital age we live in, in the internet age, 
A lot of times that third party is communication through the internet, uh, through perhaps an email, through social media, where they will post uh, a threatening message or they'll post intent to carry out an act of violence. So uh, oftentimes uh, leakage, uh, this indirect threat to a third party, is what uh, gets us into the case and what opens the case. And then you begin to carefully investigate all the risk factors within the waiver 21 uh, to see if others are apparent. And oftentimes that includes meeting directly uh, with the individual. Now the other sort of undercurrent in, that I heard in the question is that uh, threat assessment is not about uh, demographic profiling. You know, we're not trying to decide, well, He's a, he's a 23 year old male and he had a, um, he had a felony conviction 10 years ago. Uh, so we know he's at high risk uh, for violence. This is not what we're doing. Threat assessment is about focusing on the behavior of the person now. What are they doing in the present that is concerning us regardless of their demographics, regardless of gender, age, how they look, how they generally, um, how they generally appear, whether they had, uh, whether they were uh, abused or neglected as a child. Those are all the traditional kinds of questions that are asked oftentimes by psychologists and psychiatrists. But in threat assessment, you're focusing on behaviors of concern in the present and you're managing them actively uh, as ways of preventing a potential targeted violence act down the road. But paradoxically, you're not gonna be able to predict whether that's gonna happen or not but you manage behaviors of concern in the present that we know from the research are related to acts of targeted violence that have been identified in the research. Let me just add, because Jerry wasn't psychotic, but you know, if somebody is act acutely psychotic, regardless of the diagnosis, which is not what we're about uh, at that stage, if they're acutely psychotic, having delusions, it's very paranoid, that, that's an urgent matter. Uh, needs to be dealt with, and it could involve uh, aggression or violence of some kind. If the if the delusional belief includes violence, like I'm hearing, uh, aliens have told me to come and attack the people who are hacking my email. That's a serious matter right now. So that's a that's a very red flag. But if somebody's breaking down psychotically in in an organizational context, there needs to be a response right away whether or not it specifically indicates a risk of violence. Okay, let's jump, let's jump to some other questions. I know there are a bunch that uh, yeah. folks want to ask something. Okay. Yeah, we have lots here. So I'm going to throw one at you because I think this one might speak to the, the scientific aspect of waiver. This one is, who records the information and how do you know that their own perception, perception is not an influence in the outcome? Uh, you can, uh, yeah, you can never know whether the, whether the threat assessment team member's own perception is influencing what they're recording, and it likely does. But uh, in the gathering of the evidence, uh, you're documenting in as great detail as possible the source of the information, when it was gathered, who gathered it, what was the motivation of the person that provided you with that information. And by, by sifting uh, through the evidence very carefully and rationally as a team and discussing the evidence, uh, some of the subjectivity can be removed. And you'll also notice in the 21 items uh, that the items are behaviorally specific. So we try to keep our inferential leaps as tight as possible and as brief as possible, because when you get into greater inferential thinking, you're likely to have more influence by uh, subjective emotion and uh, things like uh, confirmation bias. Okay, cool. Um... Here's a real quick one for you. Halfway through the presentation, you made a reference to SPJ. Someone wants to know what SPJ stands for. Yeah, uh, SPJ is, stands for Structured Professional Judgment, and it contrasts uh, with unstructured professional judgment. SPJ instruments are instruments that outline and give you in detail uh, scientifically-based risk factors for a particular uh, a violent act that you may be concerned about. So it structures your thinking. It, in a sense, gives you an objective measure of the factors that you're thinking about uh, and then looking for evidence for each of those factors. 
and it keeps people away from what's referred to as unstructured professional judgment, where people just depend on their personal experience and their own personal authority. And the science tells us that that, that does not work anywhere near as well as structuring professional judgment through an external organizing instrument like the waiver 21. Okay. Dr. White, maybe we'll have you take uh, this one. Do you think that the be safe rather than be sorry is an influence, could influence the legit legitimate outcome of the tool? Do you think that be safe rather than be sorry could influence the legitimate outcome of the tool? You mean people uh, overestimating? Well yeah, I, th I think it's the reference to, you know, I, I have this threat, maybe I'm just going to uh, be safe. And maybe this goes up to the, the question before about uh, uh, yeah. the opinion of the yeah. intaker and things like that. Where, well, does the, where does the science take over the, uh, okay. the personal okay. side? Well, here's a, here's a very simple basic fact. It's like, there's nothing like experience. <laughs> you sharpen your, your, your judgment. Um, uh, the, the more you do this and the, and the, more competence you develop, I think the more, of course, you're able to ferret out and distinguish between these ranges of risk. Um, it, one of our tenets in this field is do not overstate risk, do not understate risk. What is your opinion? And including if you don't know, say you don't know. But uh, individuals with less experience may overstate uh, or in a, in a be safe situation, uh, but um, also, you know, you could say, look at we we think that the risk is is not that serious, but but people want security, or we just we just can't take any chance. So a decision may be based on the fact that since it could be catastrophic, even though we think the risk is low, we're going to take extra security measures. Those are, those are organizational management decisions. And as long as we know why we're making them, I, I think that's, that's legitimate. But, but people with less experience, they could, they could overestimate it, overstate it, or they could understate it out of denial. They could say, oh, Jerry's not that bad of a guy. I've known him a long time. Well, that's not, that's not an objective uh, evaluation of the situation. So, you know, this, it can go... Either way, this is where being grounded with a tool, uh, conferring with others, and conferring with experts when you're not sure. This is how you learn. And, a, and I think a really good way to learn is when you debrief your own cases with, a, with an expert afterwards. That's like, that's, that gives great leverage for, for learning. Anyway, I hope, I, I hope that's a useful answer. Reed. Yeah, I think so. Um... Okay. Reed, did you have anything you wanted to add to, to that piece before the, the no. next one? Let me, let me read the next one, Reed, because maybe you can add to that because the, um, the next one is off the, the tail end of Dr. White's there is, does the programmer tool generate a report or give you the prob probability level that will suggest there's a solution? So um, on, on the tail end of this, does waiver 21 and the tool, is it something that says, hey, there is a threat, here's your solution? Or can you explain how with waiver 21 and the tool, um, Dr. Wright was talking about the, at the end you get with a professional to analyze what was collected and make the human decision. Where, do, where does that all tail, tail off? Yeah, the, again, the waiver is, uh, is, is not a, a, a prescription or a fix. What it does is it helps you organize your data. Uh, it gets it out in front of you. It gets you to think about how these various uh, 21 risk factors uh, work together as a threat assessment team, then you would weigh the factors and determine for that particular individual which ones are more important. And then you would formulate a, uh, a management plan for the case. But oftentimes uh, assessment and management uh, go hand in hand. In other words, as you manage the case, you get more assessment data. Uh, and as you assess the case, you may be doing things to more effectively uh, manage it. Uh, but it's not a magic pill. The team has to work together. You have to develop uh, interdisciplinary collaboration among the team members. You want folks on your team in your corporate setting that are enthusiastic about this process, that are interested in it, that are earnest about doing it well. 
and the waiver becomes an organizing instrument for the uh, for the team work. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're just rolling past three o'clock here. There's still quite a few questions, um, and I know people will, will want to get going. I think um, a lot of people are very interested in your skills and your experience here. So the the one question is, do you do you do just consulting instead of training? Which I think the answer is yes. But I think for the benefit of the the audience, could you maybe just 30 seconds on if they're interested in contacting you to, to learn about how to consult and come into their companies? How would how would that work? Yeah, well, uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, in my case, uh, uh, WTSglobal.com uh, is my website, S. White at WTS Global. We do case consulting. We do training. Uh, we, can, uh, we can answer some of these questions that are left over, but sure, I may spend half an hour on the phone with somebody. You may spend a long time on a case, but sure, we consult as well as trained. And a lot of these questions, which are great questions, are addressed in the manual, by the way. Go ahead, Reed. Yeah, and I, uh, Steve and I work very closely together and we will uh, kick, uh, you know, we will refer cases to each other. And my website is uh, drreedmalloy.com. And then through that website, you can um, learn more about me if you want to. And then there's also an email there through which I can be contacted. But Steve and I both do consulting on a regular basis for uh, a whole variety of entities. Um, uh, from individuals up to and including uh, government agencies and and also um, uh, national security issues. And there's a lot of references on Reed's uh, website, in particular articles and uh, the International Handbook of Threat Assessment, which he edited. Goodman's Hoffman, I have a chapter in it. My website's got additional resources. There's a lot of good information out there uh, as well. And I think, yeah, I, have, I think on that last slide, we do have the contact information, if I'm, if I'm re remembering it correctly. Okay, uh, Jen, you want to pull us back slide. one slide there? Oh. oh, there's a full screen view of okay. Malloy. Look at that. Smile. Yeah. Yep, big smile. There we go. Um, before we wrap up, uh, doctors, anything from each of you, just sort of final remarks that may, uh, may benefit the viewers. I mean, there's, there's so many questions here about different, uh, there are different organizations I can join and where do I go find information? Uh, it looks like people are really looking for some, some direction on how to learn and where to start on, on some of this. Yeah. If I could, if I could pitch something, uh, the, the association of threat assessment professionals is a very important organization that Steve and I are both, uh, very much a part of. Uh, it's uh, uh, atapworldwide.org, uh, uh, atapworldwide.org. And then there, uh, there's also a Canadian Association of Threat Assessment Professionals, uh, which the acronym being, being KTAP. There's also one in Asia and there's one in Europe too. And uh, we both love that organization because it's an opportunity for people to network that are very interested in, in threat assessment. And uh, there are annual conventions for each of those four organizations in different uh, different parts of the world. And again, they focus on targeted violence, uh, which is what what we're all about uh, with the waiver twenty one. Uh, Reed, let me mention uh, uh, we have a newsletter that comes out roughly quarterly. Uh, my company does WTS, uh, and it, again, if you go to our website, my website, you can sign up for the newsletter. It includes information about the trainings that Reed does, as well as what I do and what we do together. Uh, but we have an informative newsletter. We always include a little feature and then announcements about our com upcoming training, and you can sign up for it. Excellent. Thank you to both of you. What a fabulous session. Um, for those still on the call, there's um, still quite a few questions out there, but we can uh, get those answered for you offline in various various shapes of form. So thank you to all of our viewers today, especially there's a large group that have, uh, have stuck around. So thanks for joining yeah. us today for Threat Assessments 101. It concludes today's session. Uh, thank you to both Dr. Malloy, Dr. White. Uh, on behalf of myself and the doctors and the Resolver team, thank you once again, everyone, for your time and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, thanks everybody. Much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.